Father in heaven, help us to realize our own sinfulness and help us to focus on you, the sinless God. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time I visit Egypt with its lush vegetation, I'm reminded of the hail that destroyed it. Speaking about hail, just something interesting, type and anti-type. The Gibeonites came to Joshua and they said, look at us, we're coming from a very far country. Clothes, worn, bread is old, sandals is almost gone. We want to uh, become part of the covenant, want to make a covenant with you. And instead of asking the Lord, what is his will? The Urim and the Tumim. They did this on empiric investigation. They saw it and it's old and they signed a, a covenant with him. And then when they got eventually to Gibeon, close to Jerusalem, they discovered that uh, they were misled. It's good to see what God says about anything. Anyway, a coalition came together and they decided to go and wipe out the Gibeonites as well as Joshua and the Israelite army. And you can read the story in the Bible, it's, it's fascinating. At the valley of Ayalon, the battle took place. The coalition wanted to destroy God's people. And Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. He couldn't really win the battle. And then God did something extraordinary. He destroyed the coalition who wanted to kill his people by hail. So hell was the mechanism to destroy the enemies. And when you look at Revelation, the seven last plagues, hell is the seventh plague. And this is how God is going to destroy all the enemies of his people. So let's look at the seventh plague in the story of the Exodus. Type and anti-type. Exodus 9.13, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Where was Pharaoh? At the river. He didn't leave his false religion. He was still there. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. Your Majesty, did you get the message? God says, let my people go. God will not allow the enemy to keep his people in bondage forever and ever. There's a time for God's people to be emancipated. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart. I want to speak to your heart. I want your heart, Pharaoh. And on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. Moses is becoming more assertive. What does it mean, I will send all my plagues to your very heart? This emphatic announcement contrasted the immediate future of the recent past and informed the king that God was to bring upon him even more severe judgments than in the past. God warns us. He's clear, he's transparent. Tells us exactly what will happen should we go this way or that way? Obedient or disobedient? He might now expect plagues of greater intensity and more rapid, in more rapid succession directed primarily at his obdurate 
and stubborn spirit. God is long-suffering. Philosophy's firstborn, the prospective crown prince, would subdue his calloused heart, and he would even beg the Israelites to go, entreating their leaders, his worst enemies, to give him their blessings. 16 and 17. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, that you may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And yet you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause very heavy rain to come down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come, surely it shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. Tomorrow, about this time, why is God so specific? God is very specific when it comes to time. It would testify, testify to the king that Yahweh was Lord of heaven and earth, and that the forces of nature, all objects of Egyptian idolatry, were the creatures of his power and subservient to his will, gradually is unfolding truth to Pharaoh. No one will ever have an excuse should they be lost one day. Far from being able to help them, these elements regarded by the Egyptians as their gods were under the control of the god of their enemies. And he would now use them as instruments for the punishment of those who worship them. Why does God hate idolatry? It's dis it destroys the worshippers. God cares about his creatures. Very heavy hail to rain down. Rain, and more particularly, hail are a are comparatively rare in Egypt. I visit, this, I visit this place every year. There's hardly a drop of rain, never mind hail. It is understandable, therefore, that a hailstorm such as that described was so extraordinary an experience as to be considered an act of divine punishment. So now God was going to reveal himself in the plague of hell, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. How do you understand this expression? This is from another typically Egyptian expression rendered by Moses in Hebrew which, with numerous others, shows that the author was well acquainted with the Egyptian language. Archaeology confirms the authenticity of scripture, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Many Egyptian inscriptions refer to the ancient past when their first king united several tribes into one nation. In verse 24, the same thought is expressed by the words, since it became a nation. Gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. What do you read in these words? Mm, God is so kind. Even in the midst of judgment, God still showed mercy warning the Egyptians of their impending doom and advising them to safeguard both themselves and their property. What would have happened had Pharaoh and his servants accepted the warning so mercifully given? Would have been different. 
the lives of both men and beasts would have been spared. On the contrary, the warning was not taken to heart and great loss of life occurred. Disobedience brings death. Obedience brings blessings, prosperity. Verse 20, he who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. Here you see some conversions. People are taking to heart what Moses is telling them. What does this tell you? For the first time mention is made that there were Egyptians who had learned to fear the Lord. So all this was worth it. The effect of the plagues had gradually convinced many of them that, that the God of the Hebrews was indeed a powerful God. They had the evidence. Have you got the evidence? They probably did not yet know him as the only true God, but only as the one whom it was advantageous to respect and obey. Truth is progressive. 39 says, a mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. That's in Exodus 12. So they were converted during the plagues, and we, we, here we see them exodusing with the children of Israel. Did some of them eventually leave Egypt and joined up with Israel? Yes. Some of the servants of Pharaoh profited by the warning given by Moses and housed their cattle and herdsmen in anticipation of the coming storm. The servants of Pharaoh, right in the palace. Monotheism, the birth of monotheism in Egypt, worshipping the Creator God. Verse 21, But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Reason? A hailstorm of sufficient proportions as to endanger the lives of men and beasts was beyond all Egyptian experience and seemed an utter impossibility, as I've said before. Do we see similar rejections of prophetic warnings in the Bible? Yeah. How was Noah's warning message accepted? And you and I, have you spoken to people about something wrong in their lives? What was the response? Not everybody respond positively. Warning concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, destruction by fire, did they listen? They mocked at Lot. Genesis nineteen fourteen. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. The response? But to his sons-in-law he seemed to be choking. How sad. I think God weeps when he looks down to this planet. But let him not weep over you and me. Where is this? Bab Edra in Jordan, ancient Sodom that was destroyed by fire. I thought of the consequences of rejecting the warnings of God. Here you see the results. Verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, stretched out your hand toward heaven, that's interesting, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. This is serious, very serious. Why was Moses commanded to stretch, the, to stretch his hand toward heaven? 
the action of stretching the hand toward heaven was appropriate for the plague was to come from heaven. Ayalon, hail from heaven. Revelation 7, hail from heaven. And God even tells us that he, he already prepared the big, big blocks of hail for the last days. Aaron's hand had been stretched out upon the waters in a similar way for the first and second plagues and upon the dust of the earth for the third. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder, something strange, and hail and fire darted to the ground, fire. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Can you imagine that tremendous noise when the hail came down? Moses had now become God's spokesman in the presence of the king and executor of divine judgments. By now he must have lost his timidity and fearfulness and become the dauntless champion for the cause of God that he remained till the close of his life. 24. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Now, what happened in Goshen? I like this. It pays to serve God. 25 and 26. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Is there another Goshen? Yes. The Goshen of God's obedience. The hail will not struck you in the Goshen of his obedience. It was demonstrated to the Egyptians that the earth is under the control of the living God, that the elements obey his voice, and that the only safety is in obedience to him. Was this mass destruction of plant and animal life recorded in Egyptian annals? Let's look at archaeology. I like archaeology because it confirms the truthfulness of the Bible. What do the ancient sources tell us? The Ipuver Papyrus describes the plague of hail and says, Indeed, gates, columns and walls are consumed by fire. Remember, the hail was accompanied by fire. Lower Egypt weeps. The entire palace is without its revenues. To it belong by right wheat and barley, geese and fish. Plant life was destroyed. 414 trees are destroyed. No fruit nor herbs are found. Indeed, grain has perished on every side. Evidence that the hail destroyed all vegetation in Egypt. Hmm. How did Pharaoh react this time? The plague of hail made a stronger impression upon the king than any of the previous judgments. God was, was still trying to reach his heart. It was the first plague to inflict death upon men and was the most striking and terrible manifestation of divine power he had yet experienced. Hmm. 27 and 28. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I've sinned this time. Old story. The Lord is righteous, says who? And my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. 
I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. I wonder if there was a time when he wanted to yield his heart to God because the evidences were overwhelming. What kept him back? What keeps us sinners back from making a total dedication to God, total commitment? What was the motive behind this confession, I have sinned? The consequences or, or a broken heart? Like, the, like some of the preceding plagues, the seventh again demonstrated the worthlessness of repentance born of fear. That's the worst motive to serve God, fear. God might thus secure the submission of all men, but the conquest would be worthless because men's hearts would not be won. God's weapon is the cross of Calvary. He conquers hearts, not with fear, but with his love. Look at this. I wonder how big were the hailstones that fell on Egypt. Must have been massive because it killed animals and people. Like some of the preceding plagues, the seventh again dem demonstrated the worthlessness of repentance born of fear, as I've just said. 29, 30. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. It's coming from him. The thunder will cease, you will hear it, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Moses looked right through the motives of Pharaoh. You will not yet fear the Lord God. May this never be said of you and me. 31 to 33. Now the flax and the barley were stuck, for the barley was in the head and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. And then, then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. What a miracle. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he gave his heart to the Lord. No. He sinned yet more. This is the problem. If we start on the path of sin, it's getting worse. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants, so that the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Looking at the bust of this great Pharaoh, my heart was so sad. There's no future in a resisting God, only destruction. He could, have, he could have become the greatest example of what can do for the most cruel king of Egypt, but he refused. May we allow God to give us a soft, repenting heart. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely split, spilt for me, a heart resigned, submissive, meek, my great Redeemer's throne, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone, a heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. 
Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new, na- write thy new name upon my heart. Thy new, best name of love. Father in heaven, we're no different to Pharaoh to a certain degree. But help us to see your love. Help us to yield, to respond to your love. Take away the hardness of our heart. Take away the rebellion. Help us to become loving and lovable children of yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. 